Uh, my name is Steve Delinsky. I'm the founder of Pizza City Fest LA. Welcome to our inaugural event. Yeah. All right. Thanks all for coming out today. Take a little break from standing in line eating pizza. Um, by the way, I know there are a couple of lines, but we have 20 pizzerias we've curated, so all of the pizzerias are great. Um, so please check out as many as you can. Um, I want to introduce our first guest today, who's going to be doing a great demonstration. Uh, Noel Broner, I met. Um, oh, and Steve Hinchliff. Hinchliff? Okay. Noel Broner and Steve Hinchliff, but Noel Broner is a gentleman I met over the phone about 13 months ago when I called him and I said, hey, Noel, um, you have a great reputation in, in L.A. For those of you who don't know, he's on Instagram at Slow Rise Pizza. He consults with a lot of the top people in town. One, to give you an example, Evan Funky from Felix, you've probably heard of, and Mother Wolf. But he works with a lot of great folks in L.A. and beyond. And um, several people I talked to about organizing this said, hey, if you're going to do a pizza event in L.A., you've got to talk to this guy. Because he knows everybody. He knows where you know, every, all the secrets are buried, basically. Um, so he's the guy in pizza, and he's the, the pizza consultant. So we've teamed up on this event. We've worked together for the last year to put together this incredible event, which I think is just a testament to the talent in Southern California and in Los Angeles, the greater L.A. area. You guys have a lot to be proud of here for, for your pizzas. But not all of you have pizza masters and earth stones in your backyards or in your kitchen. So in an effort to try to help you get better pizza making skills at home, that's why Noel is here today. So I'm literally going to turn it over to Noel and Steve. I'm going to get out of the way, let you do your thing, um, and you'll take questions at the end, right? All right, Noel, take it away. Is this thing hot? Yep, it's hot. Can I have that too? Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Hi, everybody. How are you? Welcome to Pizza City Fest, day two. I don't want to jinx it, but day one was a huge success. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that nothing goes wrong. We're going to make dough and talk about ingredients. We're going to talk about, uh, I have a, thank God I have a, uh, uh, an outline here. We're going to talk about ingredients, we're going to talk about process, and we're going to talk about equipment and small wares. A lot of what happens during mixing is waiting. Raise your hand if you're impatient. Go get a slice of pizza. But if you're the patient type, you can actually make pizza. So I always tell people, if you decide you want to eat pizza on a Friday night and it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, go order pizza. But if you decide you want to eat pizza on a Friday night and it's Monday, make dough, stick it in the fridge, and by Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you can have a smorgasbord of bread items, pizza items, you name it. All right? So I'm going to kind of walk you through it. So I've got a lot of different kinds of flour here. I'm going to start kind of walking through the different ingredients. Steve, if you don't mind, what do you, uh, what kind of uh, flour do you have over there? Uh, that's Glacier Peak from Cairn Springs. Beautiful. So he, we're going to mix with something called uh, Cairn Springs Glacier Peak. It's a bread flour, all right? Um, Cairn Springs is an awesome mill, and they do kind of artisan flour. But you know what? Whether you use double zero flour or King Arthur flour, if you use central milling flour, Caputo flour, Cairn Springs, flour is flour for, for the point of this, all right? You got water over there, Steve? Good. Is it tap water? Tap water. Some people think they need New York water. Raise your hand if you think New, you, meet, you need to make, uh, use New York water to make New York pizza. Wrong. Are you a New Yorker? I knew it. Trick question. She's a New Yorker. Mom. Hi, Mom. New Yorker? Do you need water from Brooklyn to make good pizza? No, see, I taught her. She took my classes. You should take my classes too. Great. Shameless plug, 20% off for anybody who wants to take an online class this month. Uh, go to my website, VIP20 for 20% off on the beginning, intermediate, or advanced class. All right? Good. Uh, got that out of the way. All right, so you need flour. You need water. Who uses yeast? Anybody? Raise your hand if you know what kind of yeast you use. Good. Here's the quiz. All right? Who uses fresh yeast? Good. Who uses instant dry yeast? Excellent. Who uses active dry yeast? Boo. Here's the thing. Active dry yeast is awesome, but it's like 1920s technology. We're just waiting for all the people on earth who use active dry yeast to die, and then we can discontinue it. No offense to all the people that use it. Kudos to your grandmother and your uncle and your grandfather and your great-grandfather and your great-uncle for teaching you how to bake, but it's outdated technology. You don't need to heat up water and add it to yeast anymore, all right? That was really cool during World War I if you were in a bunker and you wanted to make fresh bread on the battlefield. Not kidding about that. But last I checked is 2003, right? You can use fresh yeast. You can use instant dry yeast. Hint, 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 hint. Or you can use sourdough, which we're going to use today. So... 
I don't actually count sourdough as an ingredient because it's flour and water, all right? But I do count salt. Raise your hand if you have salt in your house. Great. You don't need anything expensive. I prefer the cheap stuff. This is called kosher salt. You can, this whole box costs like $4. It's a, it's a two-year supply. Depend, I mean, you really shouldn't be eating very much salt at all, but if you do, this, is, this will last you for, for a year. If you want to get fancy, which I always do, mold and salt. There's lots of beautiful salt out there. We'll, we'll go over those more of those ingredients later, all right? It doesn't really matter if you have gas or electric. The most important thing to have is a, oh, we don't have one, a pizza stone. All right, my favorite place, and I don't, this is a shameless plug for nobody, is California Pizza Stones. CaliforniaPizzaStones.com. You can get awesome pizza stones. And what I like about them is you can get really thick ones, like two inches thick for thermal mass. That means when you put a pizza uh, in your oven, uh, it'll bake for three minutes using the reserved heat in the stone. You'll get awesome oven spring, all right? But I'm getting ahead of myself. We're gonna talk about stuff later. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna get going on the mix because there's a lot of wait time and we'll get going. And by the end of the um, session, we're gonna have some dough that is going to go into bulk fermentation. I'll talk more about that later. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide that up into eight dough balls. My voice is already cracking. It's been a long two days. And at five o'clock at the Colab Lab, for the first eight people that come up, we'll give you the dough that we made today. All right, please no more than one dough ball per person especially that guy in the fourth row, all right? Mom, that includes you too. Thank you. All right, good. All right, so um, do you need a mixer? Raise your hand if you have a mixer at home. Excellent. Raise your hand if you don't have a mixer at home. You don't need a mixer. You need two hands and you need a bowl. But if you want to get fancy, which I do, then you want to have a mixer. This one here uh, is a KitchenAid. I'll turn it around so you can see it. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mostly you just need first and second speed. All right, so you don't need a mixer. We've got a mixer, we've got a mixing bowl, we've got a dough hook, and that's basically the mixer, all right? We've also got a scale, which we need to scale out all the ingredients. So we've already kind of gone over the ingredients. The recipe is not that important, but we're using flour, we're using uh, sourdough, we're using salt. Anything else in this uh, recipe? And water, right? Good, all right. So. Um, I, was, uh, I got all of my uh, equipment and small wares from Surface Restaurant Supply. Anybody ever heard of Surface? LA's oldest restaurant supply store. So they're on my team. I've been shopping there since before I was a pizza guy. It's LA's, like I said, oldest supply store. So they just moved to Arlington Heights a couple of years ago on Washington Boulevard between Crenshaw and Arlington. And so Frank's there today. He's got all kinds of really cool stuff. He's been known for baking for a long time. But he forgot my thermometer, so I had to borrow an infrared thermometer. This is about a $300 thermometer. You don't need one, but you should get yourself a digital thermometer. Between that and the scale, that's pretty much all you need except for flour, water, salt, sometimes yeast. Good. All right, so let's do this. Why don't we add the ingredients to the mixer? But before we do that, let's take some temperatures. All right, I'm going to give you the infrared gun. Uh, this is a quick class, so we're not going to spend too much time on temperature, but it is what I call the ghost in the machine. And what I mean by that is a lot of people, when they learn to make pizza, they don't temp their ingredients. And as a result, they make the same recipe over and over, using the same process over and over, and guess what? They get different results. And so what I, t I teach my students is that if you want to find a way to fight Mother Nature, use cold water, right? If you live in a cold place, use warm water. Because you can't control the temperature of the air, you can't control the temperature of the flour, but you can control the temperature of the water. Right, Steve? That's right. That's right. Good. All right, so we're not going to get too crazy on temperature today, but the basic idea is you take the temperature of the room, temperature of the flour, temperature of the water, you add all three together, and you divide by three. That gives you an average temperature. Everybody with me? Good. Second grade math so far, right? Yes. Then there's this thing called friction factor. Anybody ever heard of friction factor? Good. Friction factor is this a pseudo-scientific term for the amount of heat that gets added to the dough by the mixing process. Generally speaking, the more you mix, the more heat you get, the more uh, energy gets transferred to the dough. In general, the range that I'm looking for is about 72 degrees, all right? Now, if you're in a cold environment, you might want to raise that range, maybe 74, maybe 76, maybe 78. If you're cooking with sourdough in the wintertime in New York, you may want to go up to 85. But in the San Fernando Valley, where I'm from, I like 72 degrees. In Santa Monica, where I live now, I like 72 to 74. 
So it really depends on where you're from. There's no hard and fast rules in baking, but the temperature is the thing that you want to keep an eye on, all right? So let's do this, Steve. What? Water first. Let's do that. All right, so if we were just using um, regular yeast, we'd put the flour and the water in, but because we're using a uh, sourdough starter and it includes flour and water, we're going to actually add that in with the water. Breaking a rule, but uh, I'm explaining why, all right? One of the things that I learned when I went to French Culinary Institute was all the rules of artisan baking. Raise your hand if you're interested in artisan bread baking. Awesome. So I wasn't born in Italy. I didn't have a grandmother like Daniele Uditi, who was here with us yesterday, who taught him how to uh, bake in the Neapolitan dialect. I'm from the Valley. My mom's from Brooklyn. We don't know how to uh, bake pizza. We know how to order it. Right, Mom? There you go. So uh, because I don't have an artisan background, I sent myself to baking school, and that's where I learned how to make really good bed, bread. We've got water in the bowl first, then we've got sourdough, and we're going to add the flour, right? Great. So the idea here is we're going to get these into the bowl. We're going to mix until incorporated, all right? Another thing that you're going to want to have besides a scale and a thermometer is uh, a timer, all right? What I said before is you can't control time, but you can definitely measure it. So I like to write everything down. I once made an awesome pizza for myself and my wife, and we high-fived at the table, and I never was able to make that pizza again. We're going to write down the starting time, and my starting time is going to be 2.20. Are you ready? On your marks, get set, go. I don't honestly know how long we're going to mix for. The, hopefully the cameraman is going to get into the bowl, and you guys can see what I can't see. So where's the monitor? Over here? Overmixing is the enemy of pizza. You just want to get the flour and the water to come together, and that's going to happen over the course of probably a minute or a minute and a half. Hey, Steve, since I'm down here, will you stop the stopwatch when we get to the point where the dough is mixed? What is hydration? It's a fancy word for how much water is in the dough. And so the reason that people like me are obsessed with hydration is that the more water you put in the dough, the more air you have in the dough. Raise your hand if you're obsessed with air. No, you're not obsessed with it, but you need it to live, right? And the thing about uh, dough is that it needs air. Unless you like your pizza really dry. Raise your hand if you like dry pizza. No, coach, row floor. Are we done? Let me see. Yeah, let's stop it. 69 degrees. Now, you know what's interesting about that? We said that it should be about 67.66666, which rounds up to 68. And we're at 69, maybe 70, right? Excellent. Actually, we're at 71. All right, let me write that down. So here's the thing. This is not an exact science. And basically, this should. I've, I've had a lot of engineers take my classes. And they've said, no, really, you should use weighted averages. I don't know what that is. If anybody can explain it to me, I really need to know, apparently. So basically, after a minute and a half of mixing, uh, we are at the uh, point where we're beginning fermentation, right? At about 70 what? 70 and a half? Uh, we're calling it 71, rounding up. Good. All right. And the start time, we're going to call it, we'll say 2.20. So this is the time where we do something called auto-lease. A-U-T-O-L-Y-S-E. Raise your hand if you've heard of auto-lease. My friend Justin were here. He would make a joke about the lease on his automobile. That's not what auto lease is. Auto lease is all about resting. And one of the, one of the friends of pizza making is undermixing. And one of the ways that we undermix is to let time do the, the, the magic for us. Usually auto lease takes anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. If you want to go crazy with auto lease, and I suggest that you do, you can go two, three, four hours. We're at about the 224 point, so we're going to spend about another minute auto-leasing. Then we're going to start mixing again, and we're going to add the salt, right? Good. So, but generally speaking, 10, 20 minutes minimum lets the dough and the flour become friends. Then normally you would add the yeast, mix for a minute, add the salt, mix for a minute, and then we go to second speed, all right? So let's do this, Steve. Let's mix a little longer. Uh, what were the proportions of water, yeast, and flour that you guys used? Ah, you know, we're, we'll get back to that later. We, I mean, we have recipes here, but when you ask a question about proportions, I like to use something called Baker's Math. And I don't really want to get into that right now, so come to the booth later, and I'll, we'll go over the exact recipe, all right? Happy okay. to do it. Thank you. Good. All right, so let's start the auto lease right now. Uh, sorry, we'll stop the auto lease. Let's add the salt. Let's mix for about two minutes on first speed. We'll stop it after two minutes. And we're going to do what? Take another temperature, all right? Once we get to that point, then we're going to start mixing on second speed, maybe third, and we'll finish the mix. 
I can't see exactly what you see, but I can tell you what I see when I look into the bowl. I see the, uh, I see the actual uh, dough ball wrapping around the dough hook, which it wasn't doing before. That tells me that just because the dough spent maybe three minutes auto-leasing, it got firmer. And that's actually a really good sign. That means that the flour and the water are becoming friends, and the flour is absorbing the water, and that's what we want to happen here. All right? Ah, now the dough is coming off the hook, and it's starting to mix. All right? So it, just at the very beginning, you don't want to overmix. You just want to undermix. Then you add your salt. It makes the dough a little stronger. Then you go to second or maybe third speed on this, and you finish the mix. Now, when I say finish the mix, we don't actually finish the mix. We can do about 80% of the gluten development in the bowl, and I like to finish the rest by hand. This mixer is pretty awesome, but one of the things that it doesn't do as well as I would like sometimes is mix dough at the beginning. So you've got the dough kind of moving up the dough hook, moving down. Most importantly, let's take another, uh, let's take another measurement. We were at 71 before. I'm going to say we were mixing for about another three more minutes. All right, so we're going to say that right now the dough is at 71. Now, you might think, wait a minute, what about friction factor? Well, all that tells us right now is that we're really not getting a lot of friction off of this mix, and that maybe tells us that we need to go to second speed and get a little more friction. The other thing that's going on is that it's very cold in this room, right? Anybody feel cold? If you feel cold, the dough feels really cold. So I think that probably we need to go to second speed and add a little more friction to the dough. So let's try this, Steve. I'm going to, let's, let's go to second speed for another two minutes. And then we're going to go to third speed for probably another three. All right? Good. So at this point, when we're finished making this dough, are we going to refrigerate this overnight, 48 hours, something like that? Good question. Are we going to refrigerate the dough 48 hours or something like that? So here's what I would say. If you're mixing with yeast, then you definitely want to refrigerate your dough overnight. But when you're mixing with sourdough, you could actually use this dough today. I would say it would be good in about six hours. We're going to bulk ferment it until about 4.30, and then we're going to ball it up into eight dough balls. And if you guys want to take it home and make pizza, I would say it'll be pretty good around 8 o'clock. Or if you want to put it in the fridge overnight, Steve, how long would you say? A couple days. I like to find the coldest room in the house, maybe in the 50s, and let it sit there overnight. Then the next day, it's beautiful, all right? So one of the things about using a pre-ferment like sourdough or pouliche or biga or pat fermenté or all these weird foreign words is that by pre-fermenting the dough, you don't need to wait two, three days to make pizza because you're starting the fermentation before you even made the dough. So Steve, when did you start making this sourdough? How many years ago? Uh, three. Three years ago. So this dough has been fermenting, I, I'm kind of kidding, for three years. So I think we're good to go, right? Excellent. Any other questions? Talk a little closer to your mouth, please. Can you talk a little bit about the different varieties of dough, for example, Neapolitan style versus New York style, and what are we making? You're, uh, you, you ask a good question. Can I talk about some of the differences between like Neapolitan style or New York style? All right, so Neapolitan style is kind of the mother of all pizzas. It comes from Naples, Italy. And so usually that uses a double zero flour and a wood-fired oven. New York style comes from? New York. New York. Good guess. And they usually use like a gas deck oven. Um, and it, raise your hand if you've heard of uh, Le Industry in Brooklyn. Yeah, that's like a new, a new style New York uh, pizza, and they use a, a, an electric deck oven, a little higher temperature. So, you know, there's a lot of differences between uh, American-style pizzas and Italian-style pizzas. Steve, what would you call this, this pizza, if you had to say? Well, I, I really think it depends on the temperature that you cook it at. So I use a wood-fired oven, but I don't like uh, super soft Napoleon-style doughs, so I lower the temp on the oven to about 700 degrees. Good. Let's stop that mixer real quick. Good. So we've been mixing for about three and a half minutes. We'll get back to that conversation. That was an excellent question. One of the things that's going on with this mixer right now, and I'm not really paying attention because I'm walking around doing stage dives, is that the dough is sticking to the hook. So I think we need to go to third speed. We're not going to worry about the temperature because I'm pretty sure it's still about the same. So let's go to three, and let's mix for another three minutes, all right? Good. Uh-oh. Keep an eye on that. Good. So as you get into the higher speeds, you're, you'll notice that there's a propensity for your mixer to walk off the table. So 
don't wear don't wear slippers when you're mixing or, or keep an eye on your mixer all right good that was an excellent question we can talk a lot more later i would say the short answer to steve's uh, question is that we're doing a neo neapolitan it's been um stop it in 15 seconds all right so i'm getting some nice gluten development there third speed is pretty strong can you guys see that so there's no, there's no tried and true time for mixing. What you want to do when you mix is, is, is mix and you kind of use your eyes and your ears. I can kind of hear a slapping. I don't know if you guys can hear it. When you hear the dough starting to slap, that's a good sign. That's the dough talking to you saying, hey, pay attention to me. Good. So right now I'm going to stop all of my watches. Stop, stop, stop. Good. Great. So I would say, at least for, for our purposes right now, that we are done with the mixing portion and we are beginning with bulk fermentation. So here's what we're going to do. Can we get a shot of this dough? Normally what I would do is I would take it and do a window pane test. Raise your hand if you know what a window pane test is. Good. Um, a window pane test is you, when you take a little piece of the dough, which I'm not going to do right now, and you kind of stretch it and you hold it up to the light and you, you, you make a window pane and you can judge the level of gluten development. And so on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being totally undeveloped, 10 being perfectly developed, we're shooting for about a 7 or an 8. All right? We don't, you don't want to pull a perfect window pane when you're, when you're mixing like this because you want to undermix the dough in the mixer and finish by hand. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this container. This is a container made by Cambro. And we're going uh, to take the dough and we're going to put it in this container. You see I've got some beautiful olive oil in the container. So we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna take the dough out either by hand or using a, a scraper. What do you got? You, you use your hand. Good. And we're gonna put it in the container. We're gonna start the, we're gonna start the um, bulk fermentation. We'll call it uh, 235. Actually, that's wrong. 236. Good. Beautiful. Nice job. Let's go around the outside and get all that dough. Thank you. All right. So we're done with the mixing uh, part of the uh, of the demo. We're going to let that sit for a half an hour. Actually, you know what we should do, Steve? Let's make it only 15 minutes. So a stretch and fold is when you take the dough and you fold it, you fold it, you stretch it, you fold it, and you turn it over. And what I love to do is I like to do that about every 15 or 20 minutes, sometimes every 30 minutes, until the dough gets really strong, right? If you do that in a mixer, you risk letting the dough get too strong. And once the dough gets too strong, you're in trouble. Because in the epic battle between woman and dough, guess who wins? The dough. In the epic battle between man and dough, guess who wins? The dough. So I've tried and failed many times. So I like to undermix the dough, make sure the dough doesn't get too strong, right? So I win the battle. I made two quadruple batches of dough the other day with bread flour. I used King Arthur for one quadruple batch. and gold medal for the other one. One of them rose probably 30% more. Do you know why? Which one was it? Believe it or not, I would think it was the reverse, but the gold medal was rose the one more? that rose more. Yeah. Good. So the question was, she made two batches of dough, one with King Arthur and one with gold medal, and you think the gold medal rose more, right? Now, there's a lot of different kinds of King Arthur. Do you know which one it was? The bread flour? Good. So probably the uh, gold medal rose more because it was stronger, higher in protein, more gluten. Raise your hand if you love gluten. Me. So gluten is what happens when flour and water come together and become friends. The more you mix, the more strength you build. The more strength you build, the more ability you have to trap air. By trapping air, you let the fermentation process start to happen, right? And so it's a... Fermentation is a good thing, but too much air and too much strength is a bad thing, right? So you want your dough to rise, but not too much. If you have too much strength and you get really tight gluten, raise your hand if you like bagel that's chewy like a, sorry, pizza that's chewy like a bagel. You ever have like, well, you like bagels. That's my stepfather. Don't listen to what he says. He loves a good bagel. He doesn't even like pizza. But if you're like most people, you don't want your dough to be too chewy. Right? And I work with a lot of chefs, and they talk about things like mouthfeel. I'm like, mouthfeel? So what's mouthfeel? Mouthfeel, when they say, oh, I don't really like the mouthfeel, that's because it's too chewy. So what I like to do is I like to mix flours. I like to use like a strong bread flour, like a King Arthur or a gold medal. And then I like to use a weaker flour, like an all-purpose flour or a double zero flour or one of the wheat flours that has less gluten. So um, 
usually what I'll say is I like I like a bread flour for performance, and then I try to dial in other flours for flavor. Um, this is a Caputo Double Zero flour. This is really good for uh, double for uh, wood fired baking. Let's see. This is another uh, double zero flour. Uh, oh, this is a single zero flour. Uh, so it's not quite as fine. It's more like a bread flour. It works really well for baking as well. Uh, this is uh, central milling. Everybody, anybody ever heard of central milling? This is organic uh, bread flour from Utah. Really good stuff. Kind of on the pricey side, but very good. Let's see here. Anybody like olive oil? I love olive oil. So these are actually some of my favorites. This is called, uh, anybody speak Italian? Anybody? L-A-U-D-E-M-I-O. Annabella, where'd she go? Where's my wife? Ah, she's gone. Anyway, this is a very beautiful olive oil. Maybe if you go over to um, uh, uh, Surface Restaurants Supply later, he'll let you taste some of it. So a lot of people say don't waste your money on olive oil. I say waste your money on olive oil. But you know what? For me, not all tomatoes are created equal. So like here's a really nice San Marzano tomato that I really like, but they tend to be pretty acidic. I like them on a Neapolitan pizza, but I don't necessarily love them on, let's say, a pan pizza, like a Detroit style. Uh, so I would say that one tomato is not good for every kind of pizza. Um, yesterday, um, Mr. DiNapoli was in the house, Rob DiNapoli, and he came together with Chris Bianco, one of my favorite pizza makers, and they came up with Bianco DiNapoli. These are organic California tomatoes. One of them is crushed and one of them is whole, and they're excuse me, vine ripened. So they're, they're ripened on the vine and they get really sweet. And you could almost uh, just add a little salt and drink them out of the can. Actually, we were doing that yesterday. We were actually adding a little beer and drinking it out of the can. What I like about this one is that it's $6 for a can that's uh, like 128 ounces. Which is this one? Oh, sorry, 106. This is called a number 10 can. What's awesome about this is if you want to make pizza for your whole family, you've got like a three-week supply of pizza, of pizza sauce right here. So um, that's why I like to shop at restaurant supply stores, because if you want, you can get like a really big thing of tomatoes, or you can get a really big thing of cheese, or you can get like uh, really nice olive oil for wholesale prices. You could probably convince yourself that you need New York water to make New York pizza, and you could probably convince yourself that you need French water to make a good baguette, right? Chicago water for Chicago, LA water for good LA pizza, whatever that is, but Probably the most important part of water is the temperature, all right? Cold water in a warm environment, warm water in the cold environment to control the fermentation. Anybody believe me? Makes sense, right? Good. All right, so let's look at my handy-dandy little list here. We are counting down on the uh, stretch and fold. So we said 15 minutes. It's been about eight or so. Good. So we got another six minutes to go. I'm going to walk around and show you guys the, uh, the dough. Just so you, the reason I'm showing it to you now is that after we do our stretch and fold in about six minutes, I'm going to come back again and show it to you, and it's going to look totally different. What do you think? Want to smell it? Mom, want to smell it? What's it smell like? It smells good. That's my mom. She loves me. It smells good. So what I like about uh, pizza dough is that it smells delicious. Beautiful. So he's stretching. And folding. Beautiful. That's how we do it. We're going to turn it around 180 degrees. We're going to stretch and fold. Beautiful. And two more times, and we're almost done, folks. So I wish that we had longer, but I'm getting the, I'm getting the hook from the stage manager. Five more minutes, and that was at least two minutes ago. All right, so you can see what the dough looks like now. It looks a little more firm. looks a little more smooth. It's got better gluten development. It's looking more like dough now. So normally what we would do is we would do maybe one more in about 30 minutes, which is what we're going to do. Brother Dan, looks like dough. My mother says it's beautiful. She loves me. There we go. Looks like dough, sir. Looks like dough. I, notice I, la I ask really softball questions. Sir, put away your phone. This is a class. It's a flour. 1,000 grams of flour. How many grams of water? How many grams of water, Steve? 640, not including the flour in the sourdough, uh, and the water in the sourdough. Right, 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 right. Right. Okay. He's saying right like he knows what I'm talking about. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Last question. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, 
question. Um, I've made the dough, but without a starter, and yes. I put olive oil in the dough. Yep. Is that just because I don't have a starter, or would you put olive oil in the I dough? I love putting olive oil in the dough. With the, or without the starter? With matter. or without the starter, I love olive oil in my dough. Olive oil is a beautiful ingredient. It helps to brown, helps to sweeten, helps to caramelize. Why are you two wearing matching jumpsuits? More importantly... Because we can. Ah, because we can. Good. You, you ma'am? Um, because we're best friends and twins. And you are the next contestants on The Price is Right. Thank you, everybody. This has been my pleasure. I'm Noel Broner from Slow Rise Pizza. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, everybody. I'll be at the Collab Lab for the next until 5 o'clock if anybody has any follow-up questions. And I'll be standing on stage for five minutes talking to you lovely people. Then i got to get back to work. Thank you, Steve Hinckley. Thank you, everybody here. Thank you.